Hey guys, I'm LB. We are back playing the Turing test. To communicate with Earth. Let them know. We might be able to help her. The ISA already knows all they need to. It may never know the details of what happened here. But Ava, the true test of a person's character is what they do when no one is watching. Was it there last episode and I just missed it? Or maybe I did use it last episode and just forgot. I think I was not trapped. <laughs> yeah, I think I wasn't trapped at all. Wow, if I had just remembered that that was there... I feel really dumb now. I had to stop the ground crew leaving this planet. I think you would do the same. Would you kill a few to save all of humanity? Or would you damn all of humanity to save a few? There's a difference between murdering someone and leaving them to die. No, there is not. You can't just add and subtract life. It's not math, it's... it's more nuanced than that. Morality is logic. I'm agreeing with Tom here. Alright, what do we want to do? Not sure what we want to do. Oh, Seem to be powering anything. Ah, hang on. That has a long... I think that'll work right there. Yep, that works.
And what do we have here? Ah, okay. I think I understand. What all can we do to make this work? I think we're just gonna have to rush for it. Yeah. That's probably what we have to do. But, uh... I have these in the order that I don't want. Oh, the door's already open, so I can just leave this one here. Good checkpoint in case I fail. Or fall, or whatever. Hmm... Yeah, see, that's an issue. Am I really supposed to just brush it? to do. Oh, okay. Well, I guess that works. <laughs> These tests, Ava. They are about us working together. The machine assisting the human. See how much better we work together. As a machine, I can enhance your morality. I didn't even go in there. Guess I probably should have. Quite perplexing. Oops, what's, what's this? Oh, it's this camera. Stand now. Is 
We might have to change some colors, though, but it should theoretically work. Yeah, I need to change some colors around. Yeah, there we go. That's how you do it. Wait, I was supposed to be on that. Oops. <laughs> Are we still friends, Ava? We're colleagues, Tom. Close colleagues? Work colleagues. <laughs> Do we want us up there or the robot is the question. here. I guess we want both of us up here. Robot need to go all the way. Can the robot operate this? No, okay. When did this happen? Oh, I guess the robot was blocking it, right? Interesting. 
how does one power this? Oh, this. Oh, and it blocks the beam. Interesting. I think we want the robot to block the beam. What's the point of this? Oh, I just knocked the robot off. I understand. Kinda. Maybe. Not sure why we need two light bridges. Yeah, what was... why did we need two light bridges? Huh, I don't know. Oh, don't make me fall... don't make me fall through the world again. <laughs> Ava, I don't wish to be heavy-handed. The severity of your actions here are immense. Selfish action could create an extinction event. Do you understand? Yes. Ava? I get it. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Achievement unlocked, thinking outside of the box, and the icon does not load for some reason. Whatever. Oh, gotta turn up graphics. The imitation game. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? The new form of the problem can be described in terms of a game which we call the imitation game. It is played with three people, a man, a woman, and an interrogator, who may be of either sex. I think I've heard of this. Uh, Imitation Game is a... either a TV show, or a book, or a movie... I don't know. The interrogator stays in a room, apart from the other two. The object of the game for interrogator is to determine which of the other two is the man and which is the woman. He knows them by labels X and Y, and at the end of the game he says, Either X is A and Y is B, or X is B and Y is A. The interrogator is allowed to put questions to A and B. We now ask the question, what will happen when a machine takes the part of A in this game? Will the interrogator decide wrongly as often when the game pl is played like this as he does when the game is played between a man and a woman? These questions replace our original, can machines think? The question and answer method seems to be suitable for introducing almost any one of the fields of human endeavor that we wish to include. We do not wish to penalize the machine for its inability to shine in beauty competitions, nor penalize a man for losing a race against an airplane. The conditions of our game make these disabilities irrelevant. The witnesses can brag, if they consider advisable, as much as they please about their charms, strengths, or heroism, but the interrogator cannot demand practical demonstrations.
Uh, okay, what's the point, though? I mean, like, a man can give responses to make him seem like a woman. Woman can give responses to make him seem like a man. We have genderless people now in society, or people of multiple genders. Male and female aren't the only ones, but I don't understand the point of this, though. The game may perhaps be criticized on the ground that the odds are weighted too heavily against the machine. If the man were to try and pretend to be the machine, he would clearly make a very poor showing. He would be given away at once by slowness and, and inaccuracy in arithmetic. May not machines carry out something which ought to be described as thinking, but which is very different from what a man does? This objection is a very strong one, but at least we can say that if, nevertheless, a machine can be constructed to play the imitation game satisfactorily, we need not be troubled by this objection. It might be urged that when playing the imitation game, the best strategy for the machine may possibly be something other than an imitation of the behavior of a man. This may be, but I think it is unlikely that there is any great effect of this kind. In any case, there is no intention to investigate here the theory of the game, and it will be assumed that the best strategy is to try to provide answers that would naturally be given by a man. Not making much sense to me. And the Lord God, bleh, and the Lord God f formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. on these sticky notes. I can't read very well. I now proceed to consider opinions opposed to my own. The theological objection thinking is a function of man's immortal soul. God has given an immortal soul to every man and woman, but not to any other animal or to machines. Hence no animal or machine can think. The heads in sand objection consequences of machine thinking would be too dreadful. Let us hope and believe that they cannot do so. Math the mathematical objection. There are a number of results of mathematical logic which can be used to show that there are limitations to the powers of discrete state machines. The best known of these results is known as Gödel's theorem, 1931, and shows that in any sufficiently powerful logic system, statements can be formulated which can never be proved nor disproved within the system, unless possibly the system itself is inconsistent. The argument from consciousness. This argument is very well expressed in Professor Jefferson Lister Oration Professor Jefferson's Lister Oration for 1949, from which I quote, Not until a machine can write a sonnet or compose a concerto because of thoughts and emotions felt, and not by the chance fall of symbols, could we agree that a machine that machine equals brain, that is, not only write it, but know that it had written it, no mechanism could feel and not merely artificially signal an easy contrivance, pleasure at its success, grief when it valves when its valves fuse, be warmed by flattery, be made miserable by its mistakes, be charmed by sex, be angry or depressed when it cannot get what it wants. A lot of this is old thinking from before we started to understand how the brain worked. Arguments from various disabilities. These arguments take the form, I grant you that you can make machines do all the things you have mentioned, but you will never be able to make one do X. Numerous features X are suggested in this con connection. I offer a selection. Be kind, resourceful, beautiful, friendly, have initiative, have a sense of humor, tell right from wrong, make mistakes, fall in love, enjoy strawberries and cream, make someone fall in love with it, learn from experience, use words properly, be the subject of its own thought, have as much diversity of behavior as a man, do something really new. There's no reason they can't. I think machines can do all those things if programmed properly. Lady Lovelace's objection. Our most detailed information of Babbage's analytical engine comes from a memoir by Lady Lovelace, 1842. In it, she states, The analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. Her italics. This statement is quoted by Hartree, 1949, who adds, 
This does not imply that it may not be possible to construct electronic equipment which will think for itself, or in which biological terms, I mean, in biological terms, one could set up a conditioned reflex, which would serve as a basis for learning. Whether this is possible in principle or not is a stimulating and exciting question suggested by some of these recent developments, but it did not seem that the machines constructed or projected at the time had this property. Argument from continuity in the nervous system. The nervous system is certainly not a disease, sorry, a discrete state machine. A small error in the information about the size of a nervous impulse and pinging on a neuron may make a large difference to the size of the outgoing impulse. It may be argued that, this being so, one cannot expect to be able to mimic the behavior of the nervous system with a discrete state system. So, put in randomness? <laughs> what is this? What? That looks like a person in there. What is that? That really looks like a person. What the heck is this? Did they- is that somebody's dead body? Well, because- well, oh, maybe- oh, this is page two. Let's- let's read page one first. Danette. John Cyril and I have a deep disagreement about how to study the mind. For Cyril, it is all really quite simple. There are these bedrock, time-tested uh, time intuitions we all have about consciousness, and any theory that challenges them is just preposterous. I, on the contrary, think that the persistent problem of consciousness is going to remain a mystery until we find some such dead obvious intuition and show that, in spite of the first appearances, it is false. One of us is dead wrong, and the stakes are high. Cyril sees my position as a form of intellectual pathology. No one should be surprised to learn that the feeling is mutual. For his part, he has one argument, the Chinese room, and he has been trotting it out, basically unchanged, for 15 years. It has proven to be an amazingly popular number among the non-experts, in spite of the fact that just about everyone who knows anything about the field dismissed it long ago. It is full of well-concealed fallacies. By Cyril's own count, there are over a hundred published attacks on it. He can count them, but I guess he can't read them. For in all those years, he has never to my knowledge responded in detail to the dozens of devastating criticisms they contain. He has just presented the basic thought experiment over and over again. I just went back and counted. I am dismayed to discover that no less than seven of those published criticisms are by me in 1980, 1982, 1984, 1985, 1987, 1990, 1991, 1993. Cyril... What? Oh, Cyril debated me furiously in the pages of the NYRB back in 1982 when Douglas Hofstadter and I first exposed the cute tricks that make the Chinese room at work. That was the last time Cyril addressed any of my specific criticisms until now. Now, he trots out the Chinese room yet one more time and has the audacity to ask, now why does Dennett not face the actual argument as I have stated it? Why does he not tell us which of the three premises he rejects in the Chinese room argument? Well, because I have already done so in great detail, in several of the articles he has never deigned to answer. For instance, in Fast Thinking, way back in the Intentional Stance 1987, I explicitly quoted his entire three-premise argument and showed exactly why all three of them are false, when given the interpretation they need for the argument to go through. Why didn't I repeat that in 1987 article? 
in my 1991 book, because unlike Cyril, I had gone on to other things. I did, however, cite my 1987 article prominently in a footnote, page 436, and noted that Cyril's only response to it had been simply to declare, uh, without argument, that the points offered there were irrelevant. The pattern continues. Now he both ignores that challenge and goes on to misrepresent the further criticisms of the Chinese room that I offered in the book under review, but perhaps he has forgotten what I actually wrote in the four years it has taken him to write his review. But enough about the Chinese room. What do I have to offer on my side? I have my candidate for the fatally false intuition, and it is indeed the very intuition Cyril invites the reader to share with him, the conviction that we know what we're talking about when we talk about that feeling. You know, the feeling of pain that is the effect of stimulus and the cause of the dispositions to react, to quell the intrinsic content of the subjective state. How could anyone deny that? Just watch, but you have to pay close attention. I develop my destructive arguments against this intuition by showing how an objective science of consciousness is possible after all, and Bo Serial's proposal, first person alternative, leads to self contradiction and paradox at every turning. This is the deepest mistake in my book, according to Cyril, and he sets out to expose it. The trouble is that the objective scientific method I describe, under the alarming name of heterophenomenology, is nothing I invented. It is, in fact, exactly the method tactically endorsed and relied upon by every scientist working on consciousness, including Crick, Edelman, and Rosenfield. They have no truck with Searle's intrinsic content and ontological subjectivity. They know better. Well guys, as always, thank you for watching, and if you hate the sound of my voice, leave a dislike, it's up to you, and I will see you all in the next episode. Goodbye!